Hi, everybody. It's Chrissy Kalerik, also known as Lilith Ratchet, in the upcoming film, American Poltergeist, The Curse of Lilith Ratchet. Please subscribe now to Buddy Candela. <laughs> How's it going, everyone? And welcome to this new edition of the House of Horror podcast. This week on the show, I'm talking to the very lovely and talented Chrissy Kalerik. Chrissy began her acting career just a few years ago and has already starred in some pretty amazing films, most notably as the title character in American Poltergeist, The Curse of Lilith Ratchet. We're going to be talking about how she prepared for this iconic role, as well as some of her other projects, such as the upcoming comedy Granny Panties. And we're also going to talk about how she manages such a busy acting career while being a mother of three kids. If you're interested in checking out the Curse of Lilith Ratchet, you can go to the encore screening of the film at Atlas Cinemas in Cleveland, Ohio on October 28th, and you can even get a picture with Lilith Ratchet in the flesh. If you can't make it to the screening, it'll be available at Walmart, Family Video, and Netflix very, very soon. As always, if you haven't already, make sure you click that red subscribe button and turn on notifications so you know when I post new videos on this channel. And if you'd give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend, it would be greatly appreciated. Without further ado, enjoy this week's episode of The House of Horror with Chrissy Cleric. So it's been a while since I've seen you, Christy. How you been? I've been really busy, but all good. Yeah, what you been working on? Um, well, besides real life stuff, my <laughs> exciting stuff, um, I've done a, a lot of projects of other people. Um, so I've partnered with a lot of awesome filmmakers and we kind of exchange services. So sometimes I'll be an actor for someone and then I'll be a director for them or vice versa. We kind of split up roles and we're kind of teaching each other all the different different uh, behind the scenes uh, jobs so we don't have to rely on other people all the time. Yeah. Um, so I've been learning a lot of that. Uh, my project over the summer, I filmed a movie called Granny Panties, <laughs> which was one of the scripts that were um, a finalist in the Indie Incubator um, in Cleveland last year. So I was one of the finalists and I actually won some money to uh, get some rental credit for equipment. So we filmed it this summer and it was awesome. Um, so that's one thing, it's in post-production right now. And then last summer we also filmed American Poltergeist, The Curse of Lilith Ratchet, and that was um, premiered September 20th at the Atlas Cinema. And we have another premiere coming up, uh, a second screening October 28th. Very cool. Uh, I guess let's go back to Granny Panties for a second, because I had almost auditioned for that, but the timings just weren't right for me. So how did all that go? And because like, uh, we've almost worked together a couple times, but we've never actually worked on a project together. So how did Granny Panties go? Like, I'm curious, like, how, how was shooting for that? Well, we, it was probably a three or four day shoot that we squeezed into very long two days of filming. Um, we had a bowling alley that we needed to film at, and they were only available the one day. So we filmed about 17 hours on a Sunday, and were able to get everything we needed as far as that location. Um, we filmed another full day on a Monday, so we did Sunday, Monday, to keep our uh, all the equipment that we needed um, consecutive days. Yeah. Um, but it was beautiful. We had really awesome, we had a really cool steady cam. we had all <laughs> sorts of jibs and cranes and sliders that we were able to play with. Um, and we worked with um, Scott Morrison, was my um, DP for that, and he's the master of lighting. Um, yeah. His his work is beautiful, and it, it actually looks better on camera than it does in real life. I don't know how he does that, um, but the the talent was great. It was a, it was a pretty huge cast, um, and for me, it was um, it was a little challenging because I needed a lot of odd props and wardrobe that I hadn't done before. Um, so organization was critical. I had bins for every scene, so I had the right uh, costuming for the right character. Um, but it was a very large ensemble cast. Uh, overall, it went great. I've never been more organized in my life. It took me about <laughs> six months of pre-production. I had a binder for everybody, and my my script supervisor was so excited she almost Peter pants because it was <laughs> it had tabs and labels, and it was great. And now my editor is so happy because all the um, the documentation is so great that it's making it really easy for him to catalog the footage and get editing done. Yeah. So organized chaos, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Oh, absolutely, yes. And it was really fun. And the best part of our, we have some good stories that go with it. We, we filmed at a bowling alley, and the owner of the bowling alley hadn't informed the management of the bowling alley that we were coming until two days ahead of time. <laughs> so there was another event that was scheduled, and they tried to can they cancel the event and notified everyone, but not everyone got the message. So in that event was actually a transvestite show. Okay. So we had some very angry transvestites show up. <laughs> during filming um, but we were able to de-escalate them and they actually were a lot of fun and they had they were good sports about it so how many people say that their 
set was raided by a bunch of transvestites. <laughs> Not very many. Um, and and we, it, it delayed uh, production for a little bit, but we were able to get them under control, and they understood the fact it was a misunderstanding. Did any of them want to be extras after that, or did they all just leave? You no, know, they actually all ended up leaving. They were all done up in wardrobe that wasn't appropriate for my movie, but yeah, <laughs> um, yeah they were. Very, I was able to to negotiate something, and they were able to come back <laughs> another time. <laughs> so what was sort of the inspiration for this film? Well, um, I go back to my very beginning. I'm, I haven't been acting for very long. Um, I'm over 40, and I didn't get started until, you know, I was actually 40 years old. Um, and I saw an audition for tall people for a movie, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> six foot one. So I figured, that's, that's easy. I can just go and be tall. That doesn't take a lot of talent. So I showed up. Um, I was cast for that movie and ended up never being made. But while I was on set, it was crazy. It was a sci-fi. They needed tall aliens and short aliens. So okay. I qualified for a tall alien. Um, but while I was there, I met some people, and they said, hey, um, you should start auditioning if it's interest to you. So I went to ad several auditions, student films, indie films, and I got a speaking role in the first four out of five auditions that I went to. Um, so that was exciting. So I started taking classes, and I became very involved, and I loved it. And then at one of my classes, my instructor said during improv class that he thought I should start writing um, because I was able to come up with pretty random dialogue, and I guess it was entertaining at the time. So I started writing, and the, the scripts became very popular. He started using my scripts and scene studies in other people's classes, and they were very popular with the clients, especially the women. Um, so he was excited to have someone that was able to write female dialogue for him. Um, so that's how it all started. Then I figured um, I'm tall and I'm getting old and nobody wants to put me in a movie, I'm going to make my own movies and put myself in it. Uh, so that's how it kind of evolved over time. And Granny Panties um, is a very funny character to me. Everyone has kind of a lot of quirks. It's all middle-aged women for the most part um, that are starring in it and all of them have very mundane lives. In this story, they actually kind of get mixed up in the secret world of panty selling. <laughs> which is, <laughs> Of course, that's you hear. I'm sure you hear this every day, but... Um, and they kind of stumble into it. They have a, a tech-savvy um, computer geek that also has a shoe fetish that works at the bowling alley with them. He ends up helping them get online. Um, there's a washed-up stripper that's in the movie as well, Ruby. Uh, she helps them find an army of panty sellers, and they are in business. So it's just a, just a fun movie, uh, very, uh, very focused on character actors. Uh, and one thing I really love, um, I, also, I have a talent casting company, and one of my principal focus is our character actors and the non-traditional actors um, and sort of the niche actors because I really fall into that category myself being you know as far as my height yeah so the granny panties focuses on all the talent that I found over the several years that I've been working here all the talent that often get overlooked because of their size or age or characteristic so that's there's a lot of character actors in the movie yeah so you're you're pioneering for all the the women who don't fit the regular mold absolutely absolutely yeah, and I, so I cannot believe how much um, talent there is locally um, here in, in our area. Um, and the women haven't had a lot of opportunity. So I have definitely given them a chance to be in the spotlight. Yeah. So when can we expect Granny Panties? Well, it's at the editors right now. I have a couple um, rounds of uh, voiceover that I have to do when my lead actress gets back from vacation. So probably after the 48-hour festival, we're going to be doing that. Okay. Um, and it should be edited through the winter. I'm hoping early next year we'll have that ready for the festivals. Very cool, very cool. Well, I'm, ex I'm excited to see it. Um, so like you said, you just started a, a few years ago. Um, what made you want to get into this to begin with? Well, I think I've always been a secret performer, but nothing formal. I've always been, um, gosh, I, I was in high school. I was behind the scenes. I did stage crew, so I would always decorate the sets for the yeah. or the murals. I was very much in the art aspect of it, but never was on stage. Um, I was in marching band. I was a big nerd in high school, and I think that was that was my first level of performing. Um, but I used to do a lot of improv, but it wasn't anything, and I think it was more to entertain myself yeah. <laughs> and my friends more than anything. So that was, I was the queen of bullshit and smack talk for a long time, um, and that evolved into my discovery of acting, which I never considered. I didn't think I was, um, I would fit the mold necessarily, or I didn't really, um, you kind of think that acting in film is for um, other people. You don't expect that to be, or even locally, you don't anticipate Akron, Ohio, or Cleveland, Ohio, to be yeah. the mecca of acting or opportunity. Uh, so I just think just that one that one ad that I saw for tall people for a movie yeah. that was really what started it for me. It was crazy. 
Very crazy. So yeah, like you said, you auditioned for a whole bunch of stuff. You actually auditioned for my movie, Unlucky. Um, but I feel like I owe you a little bit of an explanation for this because I don't know if our casting director did. But I remember you auditioned for two roles. I think the mayor and Sam's mom or something like right. that. So what happened was we actually liked you for both roles. But Sam's mom got cut. And then the mayor, the narr- the, not the narrator, the, uh, the mayor got kind of cut to a one scene kind of thing so and the whole character because the the mayor was supposed to be the main villain actually of the story um but it got got changed in script writing and she was just had in one scene and had one line so right because initially i I think the mom role is what i was called on but i figured i'm actually super chill because movies you never know what's going to happen i never take it personal if i don't get a role or if movies never get made i mean i've been in so many movies that i've never seen the final product yeah. Um, it's just the way indie film is. You just have to kind of accept it, and I have fun with it. I'm more in love, and my heart's kind of tied to the process yeah. more than the product. Yeah. I just felt like I, because I was unaware if the casting director told you either that, because Sam's mom got cut pretty early on. So. I figured. Yeah, yeah, I figured. Yeah. So, cool. Um, so, you started auditioning in a whole bunch of films. So, what was the first, like, major thing that you did? Well, I was, I mean, as far as background work, this is kind of fun. I did Avengers, and I was actually seen in the movie, so oh. I have really good screen time. What, what scene <laughs> my were face you in? Very clear. So that was sort of my like first touch of like because people um, were texting me nonstop from the theater when it first came out, like, yeah. "Oh my gosh, I saw you!" So that was very exciting. Um, and then I worked my way up into the more speaking roles and larger films. I also did um, Outsiders in Pittsburgh. Yeah. I was in season two. I was in the first seven episodes of season two as one of the tribe members of the Kenna tribe. Yes. So I was a crazy mountain woman with weapons and also that, so that was a great experience. Every three weeks I went to Pittsburgh for five months. So it was oh, a really? huge commitment. Yeah. But that was exciting. Um, I also have done, um, I did, let me think, I guess there's so many small roles, small roles I've done, probably the largest ones um, have all gone to festival or straight to DVD. <laughs> like yeah. I have a bunch of those things. Um, right now I have American Poltergeist, um, The Curse of Lilith Ratchet. That's probably the biggest that's been distributed. Yeah. And this is the first film that I've ever had reviews done publicly. Yes. That's a big deal. Um, and I'm so lucky that it's that the good reviews are good. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't had any <laughs> bad reviews yet. Yeah. And I know that's very, um, I'm very fortunate. Like That doesn't always happen. Yeah. So before we get to American Poltergeist, which is what I want to focus on, it's Halloween time and you are the lead role in a horror movie. Um, but before that, I mean, I looked on your IMDb and you've been involved in a ton of stuff. How do you like, I don't know, how do you manage doing so many projects? And I mean, you're married, you have family, all that. Like, how do you manage doing all of this? Well, I'm very fortunate because I have a flexible schedule. And the IMDb, I've actually never added my own stuff on there. There's probably another gosh, 20 or 20 projects that are probably not on there, maybe 30 projects that are not on there. Um, because that's, that's what other people put on there for me. Um, but as far as the balance, um, I during the day, I'm the director of the South Summit Chamber of Commerce. So I have a, a, a very uh, flexible job. I have a board of directors, um, and they're very supportive. As long as I'm getting my work done, my schedule kind of flexes. Yeah. I can work at night. Like I was when I was um, before I talked to you. I'm doing work here at, at home <laughs> from my bedroom, so it's very easy to get work done. Um, I also have three kids, um, but they are they, and they're very busy and active. But I do a really good job of um, making time for what's important to me. So I have all the things that are required of me, and I have all these passion projects. And I just make time for them and make it a priority. Um, I might have a messy house or not sleep very much, but something has to give. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I make it work because it absolutely is what makes me happy. Yeah, and that's that's the way it's supposed to be. If you're not having fun doing it, why are you doing it? Absolutely. So um, I guess you mentioned the 48-hour film project, the horror one specifically, is this weekend. Yeah. Um, but you've done a bunch of them in the past, and you work with Dark Horse Productions, I think? I do, yes. Pauline is the... Um, Pauline Lewakowski is the captain of our team, and she's our producer. She's the queen of props and wardrobe. I mean, I don't know if you have any other friends that have 14 cowboy hats at their house. <laughs> my, dad's <laughs> got has, a, my dad has several, but not 14. She has 14 cowboy hats, um, but she has wigs. and I mean, her whole house is really dedicated to film props um, and especially horror. She absolutely loves scary movies. Um, yeah. She watches them all the time. 
Um, but we have a really awesome team of, uh, gosh, we have special effects artists, we have musicians, composers, uh, we have awesome actors. We have five editors this time yeah. that are specializing in different things, special effects. Um, it's, it's like a sport for us. We take yeah. it very seriously. We, you know, we have we train all year round, waiting for these events to happen. We do it twice a year. We both, we did the summer, and we also do the horror. Um, and this might be our last one, unfortunately. But uh, oh. we're kind of thinking if we're going to be doing these projects together, together and spending all this effort, we need to do our own scripts. Yeah. But we've we've definitely loved the 48 up until now i highly recommend it for anyone who's involved in film especially in early stages yeah i've done one before i did it in the summer of 2014 and it was a crazy experience i didn't sleep the entire time <laughs> right um so what's your guys's kind of process when you do it um because i know we did our own thing but like i know every team is like different on how they approach things so right and i've been on different teams prior to dark horses um and i everyone does it different i was on a team that already had a script written and they forced the elements into the script and it felt really artificial and it just didn't it didn't feel good and it ended up not being a great movie i didn't have a real positive experience with it i've also been on a team that was so disorganized um that we didn't sleep at all um the movie wasn't that great and it was late when we turned it in so it was just very stressful um we evolved i ended up um, connecting with the current team and we're we've been able to uh, be very organized as far as we have everything in place we have the perfect skeleton there we just have to flesh it out but all of us have come to the table as very purists as far as this is concerned we don't do anything ahead of time um, what we do though is have an, uh, an awesome list of resources so we have all of our actors identified um, and they're all on standby knowing that they can't be guaranteed a role but they're committed whether it's a support, um, supporting role lead role or an, an extra yeah. and also they may be helping out behind the scenes um, we also have a list of locations and this year we have some really unbelievable locations that we're not going to tell anybody about right now yeah. um, but it's i'm so ec ecstatic i can't even think straight um, so we have the locations ready and then we also have any kind of unique props or costuming that we might need so when we sit down we after we get the genre you pick your genre friday night and all the elements are given of course we all scatter the team scatter and go back to home base and start writing and when we're writing we have everything laid out we have all the pictures of the locations um we have a, we have a we i probably have hundreds of pictures now of all the different locations that we have access to um, and we've already had permission to film at and then we also have um a, a, gosh tons of pictures of um weird props or weapons or things that we might need for horror and our actors are on standby so hopefully by midnight we try and have at least an idea of what we're what the story is what people need to wear what people need to bring and the address where they need to be at eight o'clock on saturday morning we start okay. filming eight o'clock we film all day um, we're typically done by the time it gets dark unless the scene requires darkness um we're pretty much done by dark time and then everyone goes their separate ways. We feed them well. We're famous for our, our, our craft services. Yeah. And then Sunday morning we get up and they're, they're editing throughout the process. So after every so many scenes, we take the information and we give it to the editors who are somewhere stationed nearby yeah. um, in the home base. And they're editing as it goes along. Um, that way we're getting ahead of the game. Yeah. And then Saturday or Sunday morning, we there's only a small group on Sunday. So we'll be doing the um, editing, the fine tuning, the composing. We have original music that we're going to be having. Um, and we also have, uh, gosh, we have special effects artists on by to any post special effects that we might need. And all of that will get turned in by 7 p.m. on Sunday. Yeah. So um, I guess when, when I did it, I think we were a little too overprepared. And that's what our issue is. We actually did a practice one like two weeks before. Like we did our own thing where we yeah. try to do our own. And then when it came time for the real thing, like we, like you mentioned that you guys take a break from like midnight to eight in the morning. We didn't take any breaks. We, right. we scripted it out and we started shooting at like 2 a.m. and didn't stop until like eight or 9 a.m. on Sunday, like just in time right. to get it shipped off in time. Um, I've done that. Yeah. So it, it's, awesome. a, it's a crazy process. So, um, for those of you who don't know about the 48 hour film project, I'll let you explain like how it kind of works on sure. like, like what do you, well, I know the answer. So I'm just asking <laughs> like what, when you show up on Friday, what do they tell you you have to do? 
and what are some of the rules that go along with that? Sure. I actually have a high school team that I'm coaching this year, which is really, oh, really? funny. <laughs> I'm, co I'm coaching them prior to the events. Actually, I'm meeting with them tomorrow to go over all the information to them get ready for their weekend. They have some <laughs> teacher advisors. It's actually from a high school, St. Vincent St. Mary High School. Yeah. They have a team that's trying to get trying to get ready for the 48. Um, but the teams all converge upon the kickoff location. Um, there's a small presentation explaining rules and going over um, – all the, the policies and practices, um, and then they, uh, everyone steps up in, in either group A, group B, or group C. They bring up one group at a time, um, and the group is um, assigned in the beginning, and that's also the, the group that your movie is screened at the yeah. final screening. Um, but they have a big, bo a big uh, you know, hat full of genres. In the summer, it can be any movie genre. It could be horror, comedy, romance, buddy film, film to femme. There's probably 30 or 40 different ones. In the October event, there's only subcategories of horror. So Frankenstein, zombie, slasher, uh, gosh, you know, Frankenstein, <laughs> cult, occult, you know, anything, yeah. you, gothic, whatever. Um, so all of them are horror-related horror related, but um, subcategories. So we will – everyone picks a genre out of the hat, and then as you are done everyone, – everyone's done with that, and they document what you have. You're given two different genres from group A and group B. There's two, two different groups of, um, of genres. So you might get slasher, and you might get vampire. Okay. And you can choose which one you want, or you can combine the two of them. And then what you do – that they've changed that since they – used, they used to give you one, and you could throw it back. Yeah. And group, and pick from ones that weren't mm -hmm. as favorable. But now they just give you two right up front to save time and effort. And yeah. you can just pick which one you want. Um, and then everyone is given elements. Um, in the summer, you're given a character, a line, and a prop that has to appear in your movie. So it could be a barber. Um, the basketball could be the prop. And the line might be something um, like, uh, whose idea is this anyways? Yeah. That might be the line that has to be in there. And it could be anything. And the in the... Uh, horror one, they mix it up. Some years they make it a weapon instead of a prop, and sometimes they give us a location instead of a line. Okay. So we don't know what it's going to be until Friday night this year. Um, we're hoping that they don't have a location because we have some locations that we're really committed yeah. to. Right. And we, hope, we don't want to force in a location that doesn't feel good. Um, but hopefully it'll be the line, a prop, and a, um, a character. Cool. And then everyone leaves, and then they go to write their scripts. Yeah. So, um, I know last year your film was Vessels. Was that the one from last year? Vessel, yeah. Uh, tell me about that. Um, Vessel was, I think we had Supernatural, I think was our category um, for that. And we had, um, by pure coincidence, we have a neighbor of Pauline who really wanted to be involved. He is a police officer in Cleveland. Okay. No acting experience whatsoever. And he came to be a PA. And he absolutely loves it now. He looks forward to it. He does it every year with us now. He's also committed to being the um, slate. He loves doing slate. Okay. <laughs> uh, but then he's been thrown in as an actor, too. But he built a coffin, an actual life-size coffin, for his Halloween prop. And he also said we could use it for the Horror 48. So we ended up um, creating a storyline that needed his coffin. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the one character, Randy, um, was we used it as a dead body. But in the movie, there's... a uh, it's a spirit that's in Randy that's being transferred into me, who is his wife. And the there's sort of an occult um, demon kind of situation where his family actually are a bunch of creepy, possessed people that somehow are able to get his soul into my body. And, and I'm then possessed with this, this spirit. That's kind of how it goes. Um, but it was very fun to do. Uh, we, we had all sorts of crazy masks. We had someone's backyard. I feel bad for the neighbors who probably saw the bonfire with everyone <laughs> chanting and black robes around it um, down in Parma. Yeah. Uh, but that was, you just never know what you need. We, we kind of went guerrilla style with that one. We, most of the locations were on private property. But it was very fun. And then also the best part, when we were loading the coffin into the into Julie Simon's house, which is one of our, <laughs> our writers, yeah. um, and she was the director of that one, the neighbor, I look down and there's neighbors watching us all dressed in black, <laughs> carrying this fake coffin into the house. Um, so we actually, we horrified the neighborhood, um, that 48. <laughs> so it's always fun to see what you can come up with and scare everybody in the community. <laughs> That's always fun. <laughs> so um, what are some of the other ones you've done for the 48? Last, um, not this summer, but the summer before, I directed one called Retreat, 
which was, um, we got comedy for that one. And it was, um, we filmed it on my family's farm, which is a super awesome location. Um, it's a produce farm that is no longer functioning. So it had a lot of cool buildings and um, it was kind of overgrown. Yeah. Um, it looked life after people. Um, but it was a, um, a retreat for recovering um, serial killers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds like a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. Yeah, that's like a good, good, um, good theme. But we had it was most of ours are ensemble. We have a lot of ensemble casts, so we had a, yeah. a lot, every character had sort of their own thing going on. Um, we had one that was in a um, Michael Vidovich was he was I think he was some kind of sexual predator, um, <laughs> care, uh, serious killer. He had a he had a um, hospital gown on, and was often caught doing things in uncompromising positions. Uh, he would be, he, he, he was, we'd see him out of the background, he'd be humping somebody, or he would be doing things under his bathrobe that were not appropriate. So he was, he was my f very funny character. And we also had one character that never spoke a word, um, but he was wearing a welder's mask. That was kind of funny. He was our gaffer that got thrown in as a character yeah. <laughs> at the last minute. So everybody had their, their quirks, but it was, um, and we also had an awesome drone so that the farm was a perfect place for the drone shot. Yeah. But we ended up getting a several, we had we had nominated for several awards for that one. So that was that was exciting. It sounds like a lighthearted family comedy of people Absolutely. up and stuck in the back. <laughs> exactly. So um, you mentioned you guys have been nominated for have you ever won anything? And how, how important are awards to you? Because I know when we do it, we don't really care about the awards, but I know some groups they always want to win everything. So Yeah, I mean we're happy with nominations and, and we and we really love um, being in the best of screening. That's something that way you can get screened twice. Yeah. because um, uh, two weeks after they're turned in, we have a screening where all of them are shown and then they are voted upon and get viewers' choice awards. And a week later they do the best of. Um, screening so you find out who actually wins and you get to see those films um, so we're we're happy just to be nominated for things and being the best of of course we'd like to win um, we, we're, we've probably been in the top three or f probably top three for nominations the last four 48s wow so it's been very close very close yeah. um, last year for the horror we were nominated for 11 categories and we won seven of the 11 that's a lot but we did not we didn't win the overall so that yeah. was that was crazy. That was a little bit of a shocker because we just had so many wins, but um, we just didn't take home the, the grand prize. Yeah, I know Dustin Lee's group, Maple Films. They oh, usually, yeah. they usually run away with all the awards like every year. So yeah, that was yeah. we, we kind of joke that Dustin. He's like our nemesis. We're like, yeah. no, not Maple. We don't yeah. we're happy when Maple. I'm like, goodies. I think he's having a baby. He's not going to compete this year. We were happy. <laughs> yeah, give somebody else a chance. <laughs> yeah, but his his baseball movie a year a few years I forget the name of it, but it was a really great. It was beautifully done. Yeah, that actually Very talented. Yeah, that uh, we he shot that the same time um, Unlucky was shooting, so that was the summer oh, yeah. of 2015, and he stole all of our actors. So oh, <laughs> so we couldn't shoot for like a whole weekend because everyone because they were all in his group for the 48. Oh, that's so, funny. Yeah, he yeah. did it well. You had good actors, that's yeah. for sure. He, he was that was a wonderful film. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we uh, shout out. I mean, and it's it's also a fun event because you're. I'm pretty much friends with a lot of the other teams. Probably half the teams I'm friends with. Yeah. So it's it the kickoff is fun. The all the the showings are fun, and we there's a lot of networking that happens. So I find a lot of benefit in going to the 48s. Um, I think we found a lot of our crew members from the 48, kind of just mingling and um, getting to know each other. So it's highly valuable networking resource as well yeah um so besides those two were there only any other 48 films that were real noteworthy any ones that stood out to you well i said the one we um cleave was last year's that we won had 11 nominations yeah. for um that one was fun because we had identical twins that nobody knew we had they weren't they hadn't been in the film industry yeah so in the movie people thought we were using special effects to make it look like oh, the same gotcha. guy yeah. Yeah, but it was then they showed up at the at the screening and they're like, "Dude, there's two of them." So it was kind of fun that we kind of fooled everybody with no posts necessary because we had the real we had twins. Yeah, yeah, the um, the O'Connells with you. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was the O'Connells. Yeah, yeah, it was uh yeah the two O'Connells. That was kind of fun. That was uh, that was new for us. Um, yeah, and that one probably was the first one that was really um it went really smooth, went really easy. We got done filming on time. Um, and actually, and I remember we showed up at the final drop off. And they're like, oh, my God, you guys took showers? You guys look great. You look well-rested. And, like, we felt like we were grown-ups during the 48 because we, like, were so responsible and we got sleep and yeah. it just went very smooth. So we were very – and we ended up getting nominated for a lot of stuff. So even though it, 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 it didn't seem that complicated. Yeah. Typically, how long does it take you to recover from a 48? Because I know it took me, like, 
a, a little bit to get back on a normal sleeping schedule after that. Right, and I, we, I kind of go through that post-party depression afterwards because you get so excited to do it, and then yeah. when it's over, it's kind of a bummer that it's done. Um, so I kind of, I, ha I have emotional, you know, sadness afterwards to recover from. Um, but I am very fortunate that I have a pretty high energy level. So I usually, do, I bounce back pretty quick. I may like go to bed early a little bit that following week, but for the most part, I'm not too bad. I think it's because our team is really well organized, and we don't try and do the overnighters anymore yeah like you know i think we're just not in the position to we, we try and limit our location numbers and we also keep our um our cast as limited as possible so we don't have to film for 36 hours of the 48 hours gotcha yeah very that's cool. my advice yes keep it simple <laughs> cool so besides uh being an actress and writer director um you also are the owner proprietor of your own casting company so tell me I, uh, a little about that um, I have Wildcard Productions, and um, part of that is Wildcard Casting. So as far as casting, I cast anything from no budget up to high budget. So I've, do, I've done a lot of student films where people are looking for actors that might not have um, any money to pay them, but they're offering um, experience. So I have a lot of actors that are new coming in, so I have anything from that up to Nike. I've done um, I've done a Nike two Nike commercials now, yeah. which are super high pressure and demanding. Um, so, and anywhere in between, um, I cast both commercial print work and film for models and actors. Um, I do a lot of it for word of mouth. Um, I, I stay busy enough just by word of mouth, which is great, um, because I do have another full-time job, but everything I do for the casting company, all that money goes directly invested into my own film project. So I kind of, I make that money and just invest it over yeah. on the other wing of the production company. That way, um, I can justify my expensive habit. So how long how long have you been doing the the casting? Um, we opened that in. I started with a partner, um, Evie Neal, and I started um, Wildcard back in what year was that? Probably, gosh, I don't even remember now. Maybe five years ago. Okay. I think five years ago, maybe. Um, and then we had a big kickoff party, we had an Oscar party to kick it off a red carpet. We had a non, we had a, a fundraiser that night too. Um, and, that's, and, and then she ended up moving out of town, so she ended up giving me the, her half of the company. But now she's actually in um, Omaha, and she's opening a branch of wildcard casting um, out in Omaha. Oh, okay. So she's teaching um, classes right now for actors, and she's trying to build a film community there. They don't have as much of the film community there as they do here, but she's getting married next weekend. She's getting married to Horror 48. <laughs> well. Uh, so I, can't, I can't go to her wedding, but she understands completely why I'm not yeah. coming. Um, but that's how it kind of got started. And I, it, it actually started me informally casting for people like, Oh, you need that kind of person. And like, I know a guy, I'm the, I know a guy is so that's me. Um, you need anything. And even in my real job, like I'm the, the chamber of commerce director and I'm the same connector. So I, I just have this, and even before I had a job and I was like a, a young person, I was connecting like couples. I have like four couples that got married that I introduced. So I'm like a, a, so you're a matchmaker. Connector. I'm a matchmaker from in every sense of the word. So when it comes to casting, it's perfect. To me, it's it's a fun thing to do. And I got really good at casting and finding what people needed for roles, especially the unusual or unique characters. Um, so then I just made a business out of it. And, it's, and now it's a real business with a, a legitimate LLC and a tax ID number, and, and it's profitable. So what was the hardest um, person you had to cast? Like, What was like the most specific hard thing to find? Okay, this sounds really funny, but I had to find a body double for Verjao. Okay, <laughs> so he's six foot ten and he's yeah. white, and he and the afro we could work with. It was so impossible. It, it actually, they needed a, a LeBron James body double and they needed a Verjao body double. It was um, a Nike Brazil commercial that right. we were doing. Um, the extras were easy, and they also had a bunch of younger people that were very easy to find. They had specific characteristics, but they're all pretty standard. But six foot ten white guy with that build, yeah. I, I was finding like five hundred pound guys um, and some really larger people, but I was not able to find um, what they needed at first. So I actually was resourceful and went online and found tall groups. A group okay. for tall people and, and on Facebook. There's one called Tall Friends Society in particular. <laughs> um, and you're not allowed in the group unless you're over a certain height. And I am. So it worked out beautifully because I'm six foot one. So when I joined the group, I was legitimately allowed to be a member of the group. Yeah. 
Um, so, and now I'm actually still friends with people in that group. I, but I looked for, I, I did a casting call there and we were able to find somebody in Michigan that fit the description. They brought him down. They actually had to airbrush him because he was so pale. Yeah. They airbrushed him like an olive color and it, he worked out perfectly. So I found him in a tall group, tall person website, <laughs> a tall person Facebook group. Well, there you go. It was awesome. It was. I can't believe I was able to do it. So now, and now I, I'm on that group, and they're able to like women on there tell each other like, "Hey, there's a special in tall jeans over here on this website." So we yeah. share tall people uh, problems on there as well. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Um, so how can people like if people want to audition for something or get involved, where can, can they get in touch with the casting business? We um, Wildcard Casting has a Facebook page, so just go to Wildcard. Wildcard is one word. Um, we also have WildcardCasting.com. There's a website. Um, we have a lot of casting calls. We do. Um, we post there. A lot of them. Um, um, if you're already, uh, we have a database that we have, so you can put yourself um, register with us. It's free. Um, so we have um, you on our radar that you know we know you're interested. Um, but that's the best place. Facebook's probably the best place. Because often I'll get casting calls and I already know actors that will fit that. So I often will call those first. Yeah. Uh, but if you're wanting to get in the inside circle, um, just make sure you, you like the Facebook page and um, register for our, our database. Awesome. So tell me about the new film. I see you're wearing the shirt for it there. <laughs> yeah, so I've got my awesome. I'm on a, I keep telling, my kids think I'm ridiculous because I'm wearing myself on a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> but American Poltergeist... There's two versions of the, of the title. American Poltergeist, The Curse of Lilith Ratchet is what Walmart wanted. Walmart wanted to purchase that franchise, um, but the distributor who is ITN uh, is also marketing it just as The Curse of Lilith Ratchet outside of Walmart. Gotcha. Um, the, the distributor has a franchise uh, and, the, and that's what Walmart always purchases. So it's, yeah. although American Poltergeist is a franchise, I think we're the ninth installment. There are no relationships in the story. Like yeah. it's not, it's not a, a continuation. It's completely, for, it's all ghosts related stories. It's just for the marquee um, value. <laughs> exactly. But um, the good thing is, is the um, Stuart over at ITN loved my character so much that he really wanted to market it um, independently. So he shopped it to um, Netflix. So Netflix will be, we don't have dates yet, um, but they're saying in the fall, and then after the first of the year, it'll be in Walmart. Um, someone told me that this weekend it's going to be in Family Video, which oh, really? is just crazy. I don't even know. It's funny you don't even think there's still video stores out there. But oh, family, I work. I used to work at a Family Video. Yeah. Yeah. Well, apparently Family Video has it on their catalog right now. It's coming out next weekend. Oh, really? It's kind of crazy. Yeah. So people can get it there. Yeah. You can also come to the premiere or the second premiere, which is a screening on on October 28th. That's a Sunday. Um, red carpet, not red carpet, but we did red carpet before. Six o'clock doors open. Okay, so America, yeah, I mentioned American Poultry Guys. On the 28th, when we're having the second screening, we're going to be doing um, a costume contest as well, or a costume party. Um, and I will be in full wardrobe and makeup as Lilith Ratchet. Very cool. Um, so sort of how did you get involved with this project? Take, take me back. Take me back to the beginning. Um, well, it started a while ago. It was probably even a year before we filmed it. Um, Roger Connors and Eddie Langell, the director and writer, and um, Roger was one of the stars, and he assisted with writing as well. Um, they approached me at an industry mixer for the Cleveland Film Commission, and Roger's like, this is who I'm talking about. This is Chrissy. He introduced me. Um, and I'm, again, because of my height, they wanted someone that was sort of intimidating and um, sort of, you know, hovered over everybody in the movie. Um, and they also, I, in, in hindsight, it was really funny because they're like, look at her bone structure. Look at those cheekbones. Like, I have the perfect creepy face. I'm like, you guys are so sweet. You're making me feel really good. Um, but they approached me and I said, sure. I, I had no idea what, what would come of it. I was just open-minded to the idea. I'd never um, been a villain per se. And I'm also not a big viewer of scary movies. Um, I don't like to be scared all that much. <laughs> Um, so that, that it, it started something very simple, and it evolved into a lot more. I became I ended up casting the movie for um, Eddie as well. I was able to get an awesome. Um, the, the reviews are coming back also wonderful um, as far as the actors. The actors are getting a lot of positive reviews. Um, but it took, gosh, I probably filmed over maybe four months okay. off and on. Um, there was a, there was a six week window probably that was really really um, exhausting, and most of our shoots were overnight. Um, so I would work during the day and film overnight, and I had those crazy white contacts, and the yeah. hardest part were the fingernails. I yeah. don't know how women work with those. 
oh my gosh, yeah, it's not easy. And I had a giant hoop skirt. So I would try not to drink anything because I didn't want to have to go to the bathroom with these crazy nails and the giant hoop skirt. Yeah. So there was no sort of like audition process. They just kind of saw you and were like, that's it. They did. Yeah, I never auditioned. And the, the the best part is there was not one line of dialogue that I, I was in the whole movie and I did not say one line. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I guess, what what does it take to transform yourself into this character? Because I know I worked on a horror film before um, called Held Heathridge and we casted this girl, Jenna. Oh, yeah. be- beautiful young girl, but we made her this evil, like, crazy character and you would never guess... Like, <laughs> right. what she actually looked... We actually incorporated a scene into the film before she is evil, just so people can see what she, like, actually looks like. But what That's sort? Of, what was sort of the process to get you into this character, and how long did it take, like, every day to get into it? It took a little longer in the beginning until we kind of mastered it. We actually did some test runs. I mean, they started with prosthetics, and they started with all sorts... Just to try and see what they really wanted Lilith to look like. But the, the testing, um, they ended up not liking um, the, the all the prosthetics that they did. And they ended up coming. Roger picked out the wardrobe. It's a beautiful um, hoop skirt, really creepy, um, from like 1800s Victorian era. Yeah. And it also had a choker, which they liked because in the film, I had been beheaded back in the 1800s. So it kind of, kind of would conceal my beheading um, with that wardrobe. We also... Um, Daniel Click and his girlfriend Sarah Reiser were the makeup artists on that. Um, so they sat down and did the test, and it was they, my favorite. Um, gosh, I forget. It was hilarious. I think it's called Death White. Is the color that they put on me? The base was a Death White, um, but they went through and basically anywhere I put concealer, they put black makeup, and it really kind of it aged me quite a bit. And it made me super creepy. And so there's nothing prosthetic on my face at all. That's just my real face. <laughs> that, sadly, it's my real face. But just the way the makeup was done was beautiful. And he did a lot of detailing um, on the neck. He drew in, like, veins and all sorts of creepy stuff that on occasion you'll catch a glimpse of in the movie. Yeah. The process took about um, it cooked about two hours in the beginning. And then we got down to about an hour and a half. Okay. Because we had to do the nails as well. So we had um, makeup he- and getting into the actual dress itself. And also, it was luckily it was a wig, so the wig was easy to come off and on, um, you know, rather than doing my hair every time. Yeah. And it gave that consistent look. Yeah, the continuity was there. And I had contacts, and I also had teeth that came in and out. So the fangs um, were fit to my mouth, like football guard kind yeah. of thing. So, um, and I could pop those in and out as needed. Very cool. So you mentioned a little bit your backstory in the film. You were beheaded, but what's what's sort of the plot of the film? Um, Lilith Ratchet was um, again. She was back in the eighteen fifties is when she was alive. Um, she found out her husband was having an affair with another woman in town, um, and she had been mixed up a little bit with um, uh, some people that were doing the occult, and she ended up um, beheading the girl and giving so there's a little story a little nursery rhyme that goes with it um Lilith Ratchet took a hatchet uh offered or afforded her husband's his lover's head in a basket okay um and play the game say her name feel her pain there's a little rhyme that goes with it um so basically what happened is um she beheaded the uh, the girlfriend and it turns out that the gentlemen that were helping her with the with the process didn't realize the woman she was going to kill was one of their um, sisters. Oh, okay. So they killed her, and then they ended up retaliating because they killed the the woman. Um, she also killed her husband, so she beheaded the husband as well. So they took Lilith out back and um, beheaded her, and they actually shrunk her head down. Um, and then it was cursed at that point. the 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 head was cursed, um, and they it ended up being passed from generation to generation. It showed up, um, but there was. Um, a scene where the head is then found by the current character. Someone actually steals the head from a novelty store, like it's a witchcraft store. Yeah. And since, since it was filmed at um, Apothecary down here, um, down in Akron. Um, but they, it, all hell breaks loose after that. So they end up playing the game. They say the, the nursery rhyme and they toss the head around like a hot potato. And the people that go out of the game, they're, I come back after them in the order in which they are out of the game. Gotcha. So, um, sounds like pretty scary stuff. 
It's pretty creepy. Yeah. I think the review, the, my favorite reviews so far um, have said that I'm like the female Freddy Krueger. <laughs> and also, I'm very, um, I, my motions, I creep around a lot like um, like the guy from Halloween. So Michael Myers. Michael Myers. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I did have a, I had, I had a persona that I really, and because I, I didn't have dialogue, so I really had to come up with her mannerisms and her facial expressions. Um, and it was, and I kept it consistent. And I also had a certain way of walking because I had the hoop skirt. You couldn't see my feet, um, and I didn't want to look like I was walking. So I had, I sort of bent my knees and had this little sway that I did. It actually looks like I'm floating. That's something yeah. people were asking me if I was on like a hoverboard or something. It was just me being creepy, walking weird. So how did you prepare for the role? I know everyone like prepares kind of differently. So how did you get into that character? Um, well, like I said, I, I kind of I took on this persona when I was with her and I, um, and I was very, I knew I was a demon, so there wasn't anything they could do to me. So I was kind of playful with my victims. Um, and I did, I was very casual and I think that made it really creepy. Um, and I was very vengeful towards the people. So I kind of had that, <laughs> that concept in my head. And what's actually um, funny is that I didn't even read the whole script because I didn't have dialogue. Yeah. And I really, and I didn't watch the movie until it was screened on the big screen, although Eddie kept wanting to show it to me. I don't like, I like surprises. I didn't yeah. want to, I didn't want to see it, see it on a small screen. I wanted to see it how it's, it needed to be displayed. <clears throat> so I, I knew majority of it, but the scenes I wasn't in was a surprise to me. Yeah. So it was very exciting. I like to know, I don't like to be uh, the, the spoiled. Uh, cool. So let's talk about the, uh, the head shrinking a little bit. Did they have to like make it like a cast of your face or something or how did they did? Well, they, in there, th when they beheaded me, they had a fake head of mine that fell into a basket also. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Alan Tusks, do you know Alan Tusks? I, I, I know the name. Yeah. I think I'm Facebook friends with him, but I've never met yeah, him. Yeah. He, um, he's awesome. He's been done a lot of really cool projects in the past. Him and Daniel, um, and also, um, Daniel's partner, Greg, we all got together in a garage one night um, and they completely encased my whole head and shoulders in plaster. Okay. <laughs> um, I was completely submerged, like rock, getting rock hard there for a, at least 20 minutes. Um, so it was a, probably not good for people who have anxiety or claustrophobia. Yeah. So all I had were the little tiny nose holes. There's no straws. He just left holes where I could breathe. Yeah. But Alan was amazing, and he had a very soothing voice. He talked me through it the whole time. Um, and then, then it, but it was so amazing. So, and, and what they did like clay, they did the, um, cast and then they poured it and then they had this clay thing and he sculpted it. Um, and they, they've actually, he's actually made this, he made the shrunken heads as well. And he also did a mask of me, which is really funny. He did a actual Halloween mask <laughs> of my head and, um, him and Sarah were laughing because every time they opened the refrigerator, there was a clay head of Mike. So my head was in the refrigerator for like two months. I think I saw it's, a picture of that actually. <laughs> yes, it was hilarious. Like I apologized you to wake up in the morning to see my head. Um, but it was it's a very surreal experience to see your head like that. Um, but it but they they ended up doing um, I don't remember the fabric or what it's made out of, but it's like the um, it, wasn't, it might be like a silicone type thing. Yeah. And then they they made the be so now I have a severed head of myself somewhere <laughs> out there, which is exciting. I'm hoping to get a hold of it one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, you mentioned that you're in the entire movie, basically. Were you there on set, like, every single day? It, not every day. Um, luckily, there were some scenes I wasn't required. The daytime shots were mostly um, just the principal cast, sort of per talking talking about me quite a bit or what was going on with me. Um, but luckily, I wasn't there. I was there a lot, but not every day. Did and you I, I did help a lot out behind the scenes as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So helping with some... But, you know, production stuff, which was necessary on a project like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, did you have to do any work in post-production? Did you have to do, like, any voiceovers or anything like that? Well, yeah. you don't have any lines, but did you have to, like, yeah, so for or me, anything? <laughs> yeah, post was really easy for me. Um, so it felt like um, it was over for me for a long time because I didn't have – I mean, we talked about it, but um, and I heard updates about it, but I had no involvement. It wasn't until uh, we started to promote the premiere that I really kind of got involved again. Um, so I'm friends with everybody on set. So it was just, for me, it wasn't the focus. Poor Eddie, he, it never stopped for him. He filmed, went into post. It was nonstop until the, he's exhausted. I think yeah. he's ratchet. He still calls me ratchet whenever he sees <laughs> me. I will forever be ratchet to Eddie. Yeah. So tell me about the premiere. It was a sold out premiere. Tell me, tell me everything about that. That was amazing. Um, it was so much. It was it was a really fun premiere. They had a cardboard cutout of me as the character, so people were posing with that. Um, they also had a really awesome movie poster that, that our distributor um, 
uh, made for us for the uh, movie. And we had, gosh, I don't know, we, I don't even remember a final number, but there was there were a few hundred people that showed up. Um, and I took pictures with strangers. I got autographs. I signed autographs. Um, I made a lot of new friends that night. Um, and the cast were just really proud of the whole thing. They did a little contest in the beginning, too, where they hid envelopes with a picture of a hatchet on it. Okay. And they gave away prizes. So we had door prizes for people that attended. Um, Gosh, and they were chanting Ratchet in the beginning. It was just, it was, the, the crowd mentality, the mob mentality was really fun. People were very excited about it. And there, and I, it was exciting to look around and see people's reactions because there were certain things I knew were coming because I was there when it was filmed and other things I was surprised by. But people laughed when they were supposed to laugh. They had a jump scare. They actually got scared. Um, so I was very proud. To, and and, and for, it is an indie film. People have probably low expectations coming into it. But the, the funniest and most common response is, it was way better than I thought it would yeah. be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I think that's a compliment, but yeah, thanks. Um, but we had a, an overwhelming point. At the end, it was fun because we did a Q&A. Yeah, I was going to ask if you did. Crew. Yeah, and it's kind of fun to hear the behind-the-scenes stories. Um, so the cast and crew were up on stage, and we got to kind of tell stories about what happened on set. Um, and everybody kind of, everyone appreciated um, being acknowledged. It was nice for the cast, especially the crew. Yeah. What were some of the questions people asked you? A lot of, like, the one question was how to, there's a scene in the, in the, um, in the trailer, too, where the hands come out of the bathtub, kind of Freddy, Freddy Krueger style. Yeah. Um, everyone asked me how we did that. Um, and I am too big to fit in the bathtub. We actually, there was an actor, um, actress who was um, Brianna Burke. She was the half-naked young girl in my bathtub. And that was actually my real bathtub okay. in real life. <laughs> Um, but we had we ended up getting the sound guy, who was Jake Kita, who was also yeah. um, a swimmer in high school, who could hold his breath for a really long time. They they did his hands to look like mine, and he okay. was much he was shorter than I was. He actually was literally laying under the underneath her in the in the bathtub. That's interesting. <laughs> it was, uh, you gotta so do like, what you, you gotta sure do. You're gonna be okay. <laughs> What'd you say? I said you gotta do what you gotta do, I guess, to get the shot. He was com yeah, he was committed. Um, so I have some great pictures of him with my nails on. Um, yeah. That was a very, and a lot of people. Um, we we had some really cool special effects. William Johns did a, an amazing job of the uh, um, of a uh, of some. I can't. I don't want to give it away, but there were some special effects that he did at the end. They were crazy. And also, there's a scene you see in the trailer where someone gets hit by a car. Yeah. Um, poor George Tootie is the actor. George got hit by a car. <laughs> And um, Meg, um, who did the special effects on that, was unbelievable. It looks like he's getting hit by a car. It was a real quick flash, but um, somehow she bent the footage um, to make it yeah. look like he bent around the car. Right. So, she, so we had some really talented post-production people. Awesome. Do you have any other uh, like on-set stories? Well, gosh, you know, we were exhausted. The one night we, we were filming in Rockstar, <laughs> which is a nightclub, and they were opening the following week. So we yeah. only had one day. Um, we filmed for 22 hours straight. Jeez. And I had the contacts in the whole time. Um, and then the worst part is that we had already planned to film the next day. And that morning, it was like a holiday. I forget what holiday even was. Oh, my gosh. I remember it was maybe it was Labor Day that year. I can't remember. But I had promised my kids I was going to go somewhere with them. So I couldn't sleep that day. I did some family activities and went back to film that night. Yeah. And that was the film where I had to um, kill poor um, Angela Cole in a garage. Yeah. Uh, but I was, it was, and I'm actually pretty easy to get along with. <laughs> that was probably the first time ever on set that I was really grumpy. <laughs> and so it was, we were all on edge that day. So that was, we can laugh about it now, but like, oh my God. But we were, that was the most committed um, cast I've ever seen in my life. Having to deal with the long days and the and if you've been in indie films, you know you got to yeah. do what you got to do. Um, so we all got together and did it. Um, we didn't. We never had any problems though, as far as um, we never had any cops show up or yeah. we never had any, any any major tragedies that happened on set. Um, we forgot some things here or there. Eddie like forgot a hatchet one day, and we had to kind of come up with something else. But yeah, for the most part. Yeah, we, we pulled it together. We all worked together and got it done. Was there anything that you filmed that you remember that like didn't make it into the final product? I think all of my footage pretty much made it in. I, I think the very last scene of the whole movie, uh, my son is actually in the movie, and he's the very last closing scene. Okay. Um, they were so, they actually in, 
we filmed it with um, showing me with the, the two kids, but for some reason, they, they, it was better the way they cut it. Um, so that's really the only thing I can think of that I didn't make it in. So not um, like full scenes. made it in. Yeah. But there's, there, were, there were a couple scenes or some footage that, cut, that some of the other characters got cut out. So um, I remember that there was one character, unfortunately, that I didn't really see in the film. And I, I, I talked to him afterwards. But he was okay with it. He still loved the film. And he had yeah. a quick cameo. Yeah. But his dialogue got cut. Yeah, sometimes those things happen with indie films. So you never really know <laughs> what's going on. Um, so what you said, you've been getting a lot of reviews, mostly positive ones, I'm assuming. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, I, I, I guess this is, I've never been reviewed as an actor before. Um, so that was a weird experience and I didn't even think about it ahead of time. Um, but yeah, we've had, we have had a, a couple podcasts and, um, a few written reviews that have all come back great. Uh, and, and I, and it's exciting cause I think that, um, they're, they're giving a lot of positive reviews as far as the storyline. They're saying there's a there's a fun twist ending they didn't see coming. Uh, the quality of the film has been um, talked about quite a bit as far as the cinematography and the sound quality are just unbelievable. Um, but the and, uh, but the best part is that they're saying their favorite part was me, which is very exciting. Oh, you're the title <laughs> oh, my character. God. It's so exciting. Yeah, like the character is kind of unique. Um, but everyone's saying how incredibly scary I am and creepy I am. There, yeah. There's not. It's not a really gory movie. It's more suspenseful and creepy, yeah. more than anything. It's not a big slasher. Yeah. So um, remind everyone that's listening to this when the um, encore screening, because I know my sister-in-law like loves scary movies. So um, mm -hmm. just remind everyone when they can see it again. Um, it's going to be at um, Atlas Lakeshore Cinemas, October twenty-eighth. It's a Sunday. Six o'clock, we will be opening the doors. Um, I'll be there for um, picture opportunities, and also it's a costume party, so people are in, um, encouraged to wear costumes as well. Um, and the film itself screens at seven o'clock, and there will be an after party as well. The location is going to be announced um, pretty soon. Very cool. So I heard a little rumor, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but is there a sequel in the works or a spiritual successor to it? You know, I think that which. <laughs> Believe it or not, people have called for the sequel even before it was done. I think that they really felt like it had potential. Um, Eddie is just exhausted with Ratchet right now, so I don't think it's his, his train of thought. But he's completely open to it, I think. Yeah. Uh, and I keep joking with my son that he's going to have to star in it because he was the last scene. Yeah. <laughs> but he's only 13. Uh, but I think that there's definitely potential. Um, the way the story ended, there's a lot of different directions it could go, and it could definitely have a, a follow-up movie. Very cool. So what can we look forward to next from you? Well, after the 48, I'm going to start going into post. I have Granny Panties to do. I have another film that was a drama um, that is also in post that I just have not gotten to yet. Um, and I also have some personal stuff. I'm a coach, and coaching season starts <laughs> yeah. next month. So I kind of chill out in the um, in the fall a little bit, and then I'll pick up again in the winter. Um, so I'm very open-minded to projects. Um, if anyone has anything that they need cast, I'm happy to cast it. If they have a role for me, I am very open-minded to hear what the project is about. Um, I'm again, this is this is my passion. I love it. So any at any level, I like to be involved. And you'll definitely see more coming very, from me. Very cool. I I know that you said you don't really watch horror movies, but um, do you have any favorites? Any favorite horror films? I think I like old school. The old school stuff, like how I, old know, school. Yeah, well, I love I like the stuff from the eighties and nineties. Gotcha. Like the scariest movie I remember as a child was Salem's Lot, which is kind of funny. Watching it now, it's super lame. Yeah. But I was horrified back in the late seventies or early eighties whenever it came out. Um, now I really get I, I don't I, I'm mostly afraid of movies that are like psychological um, kind of thrillers or things that could happen in real life that yeah. kind of scare me. Yeah, anything, um, I'll watch those kind of things. I'm not really into the bloody chopping up movies. That's not my thing. Like, Saw is very upsetting to me. I can't watch it. Yeah, <laughs> I see. <laughs> so, um, I guess as we wrap up here, um, just tell everyone again, like, uh, do you have a Twitter, Facebook, Instagram that people can check you out, check your stuff out? Do you have a YouTube or anything? Um, well, easiest thing to find me right now is on Facebook. You can find Wildcard Casting on Facebook and connect with me that way. Very cool. Um, so thanks for coming on the show. I hope to work with you on something in the future. I hope hopefully. so. Yes, and I'm hoping to make it to the encore screening of 
the film I'm looking forward to, so I'm hoping I'm able to make it to it. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, if not, you can catch it at Walmart after the first of the year. Or, or at Family or Video. Yeah, Netflix will have it pretty soon, too. So I'll let, I'll let everybody know when it's coming. Very cool. Well, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, I, awesome. Thanks for having me. Have a, have a happy Halloween. You too. So that's it for this time, guys. I want to thank Chrissy again for being on the show. If you haven't already, please make sure you go click that red subscribe button and smash a like on this video. Share it with a friend and always leave me a thumbs up. If you're interested in checking out The Curse of Lilith Ratchet, you can catch it out at a theater or a store near you. And we will see you again next week on another edition of the House of Horror Podcast. Take care and stay spooky.